good morning and good evening from whatever the part of the world you are so today this is our web webinar 39 and today we have uh, with our with us dr sebastian lobo guerrero he is an accomplished uh, geotechnical project manager and laboratory manager at ages pittsburgh pennsylvania with over 22 years of expertise in geotechnical engineering he specializes in design, designing deep and shallow foundation, earth retaining structures, and landslide civilization solution. He's also a lecturer at the University of Pittsburgh. He shares his knowledge with the next generation. Dr. Guerrero's contribution to the field are evident in his 150 plus technical papers and presentation featured in global scientific journals. He has co-authored and instructed the state of Delaware LFRD bridge design manuals further solidifying his impact. Dr. Guerrero has also played key roles in personal organizations, serving as former chair of Pittsburgh ASCE Geotech Geo Institute, director of ASCE Pittsburgh section, and a member of DFI Anchored Earth uh, Retaining Committee. He has taken on leadership position at uh, conferences and many more and uh, there are a lot of achievements to just go through it so you can just visit his linkedin page so over to you dr guerrero you can all right just, you thank you very much thank out. you very much and that's the that's the bottom message because this presentation is all about linkedin i'm a big fan of linkedin it's important to be connected if somebody's not connected here on linkedin let's let's do it because it's extremely important I, I actually do that here with my students but anyway thank you very much for the for the invitation let me just share a screen and we I'll can switch be... off my camera and it's over to you now. All right. So, if, so if you're seeing my screen, problem, right? If there is any problem, I'll just inform you. Absolutely. All right. So you, yes. you see now my screen, right? Big screen. Yeah. Yes, it's visible. All right. So let's get started. So, yep. So thank you very much again for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. Uh, you know, it's uh, it, it's great. It's it's awesome that we can connect via internet and and you guys are almost at, or at night and i'm i'm just starting my day but we have the we share the love for for these topics and you know we want to be together like this so as, as you know as it was mentioned my name is sebastian lobo guerrero i just to give you a little bit of information about my background i was born in bogota colombia uh i was raised there i did my bachelor's in civil engineering there then i had the opportunity to come to the university of pittsburgh did my master's and phd been working in consulting industry for 18 years now and at this company and i also teach at the university of pittsburgh uh, but beyond that what we're going to talk today this is probably a presentation like no other presentation you have seen it's a very relaxed presentation i invite you being the time that it is in india if you want to get a drink some food as much as well this is going to be very informative and very relaxed a lot of pictures so with that i have to make a, an introduction and a parenthesis of who I am in the sense of I am obsessed with geotechnical engineering. I have always been obsessed with what we do with ground anchors, rock mechanics, things like that. So here are some pictures that probably will explain a little bit more. Uh, the one on the top left is me growing up. My dad was a contractor, a highway contractor. So he used to do a lot of these, you know, the things that we're going to show today. Uh, and that's me going into a rock slide in Colombia, uh, you know, and, and always with that little camera. I used to love that camera, go and take pictures and all that. I really have no idea of the mechanics of the things that I was looking, but as a kid, it was just something that attracted me a lot. I think I still do the same. It's just that instead of having that camera, I have my cell phone. Uh, on the right side, you see a picture of me as a teenager, um, doing the same thing, going with friends for trips and excursions. And I was always fascinated by the bedding and the jointing of the, you know, of, of the rock. And, and that's something that, yeah, it, it always called my attention. I have no idea at that time what rock mechanics was, right? But I just knew that I liked it. Uh, and then going down in the in the pictures below, on the left is me uh, presenting in the MIT in Boston uh, exactly 20 years ago, almost 21 years ago. Uh, you can see a younger version of myself, uh, but that also shows that since then I love, you know, to share what we do, right? And, and I'm extremely proud of, of 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 what we do. I'm very proud of what we dedicate our lives and what we dedicate our careers to. Uh, and I think it's a it's really a lifestyle and it's a profession that takes us to different places and define the life that we have. Uh, so sharing that is also important. And then on the bottom right is it's just the most recent picture. Uh, it's extremely funny. This was not in purpose, but when I put the pictures together, I realized I still wear similar red shirts like the one that I have on the top left. Uh, I guess at the end of the day, we never really change. We're just the same person that we are when we were kids. 
uh, it's just that now I guess we, I don't know, we get more knowledge. Uh, and then the, the little person there is my son. You're going to see him around the presentation a lot. As I said, this is going to be a very unconventional presentation, a lot of family pictures and things like that, but that's just who I am. All right, so the outline, we're going to talk about active and passive anchors. Uh, this is kind of a definition that has been created more recently, like in the last decade, I would say. Uh, before that, it was just anchors, right? But we're going to talk about what is the difference between active and passive. We're going to cover design. We're going to cover construction. We're going to cover testing, which is extremely important. And we're going to do all this through examples. I, I really believe that the only way to learn things is to do them yourself, right? So everything that I'm going to show you are my own projects, and it's on a span of 20 years, and like the different lessons that I have learned. Uh, design resources for active and passive anchors. There's plenty of resources. I do believe I come from a country that is in the developing world. So access to fancy books and expensive documents is not an option at all. So I grew up used to look on the, well, the internet was just starting when I was, a, you know, when I was in college and things like that, but I kind of grew used to design manuals that are free. I love everything that is free. So I only, in these presentations, I only share links and things to, to design manuals that you can access for free wherever you are. Uh, if you cannot, you can find all of this on Google, but if you can't, for some reason, just send me a link, send me a, uh, sorry, send me a chat on, or a text on LinkedIn, and I will provide you the, the link. Uh, there is a variety of, of, of manuals. The Federal Highway Administration in the U.S. developed manuals already. It was kind of the beginning. The PTI, post Tension Institute, developed some manuals too. Um, then that it goes into different states, like in, for example, in the US, different DOT, Department of Transportation have created their own manuals. Ashto has its own manual. Uh, the ones that I recommend there are the PTI manual. It has all the specific design, Ashto, LRFD, Pendo Design Manual is from Pennsylvania. I was the co-author of the Bridge Design Manual in Delaware. We also have all the information on anchors there. And I don't think we have too many people that speak Spanish today, but if somebody's listening, uh, one excellent manual in Colombia is the CCP 14, which is basically a translation of Ashto to Spanish, and it also converts units from English units to international units. So all the presentation and everything we're going to see, it's it's based on, on these documents, mostly for the active anchors. Active anchors are the oldest anchors. An active anchor is just you make a, a hole in the ground, you put a, a strand, you put some, some you know, some concrete, in this case, is a grout, right? It's just cement and, and water. Uh, sometimes could have sand, but it's mostly just cement and water. And then you test it. And then once it's tested, you lock it off. We're going to see all this in detail. I just wanted to kind of give you the principles. Uh, active anchors probably have been doing, we have been doing anchors for, I don't know, 70 years, maybe a little more. But in reality, the understanding of those active anchors came with Terzaghi and Peck in Chicago in the 50s when they were developing the underground system and the basements for, for a lot of construction they develop what we call the trapezoidal pressure diagrams. And the way that active anchors are designed, and we'll see it in the next few slides, is that you have a vertical surface, you put the anchors, you develop a trapezoidal pressure, and then you design based on that. Uh, typically, they are half inch or 0.6 inch strands. Each strand is it's, it's composed by a lot of small filaments. Um, the, you know, the steel that we use is a high strain steel, 270 KSI. And typically, an anchor has eight strands. That, that's, or we could have less, but you know, that's a typical value. The typical design force, and again, I'm just going to go with the magnitudes more than the actual, you know, quantity itself. 200 kips is a regular design for a transportation anchor. That's about 100 tons. Keep that number in mind, 100 tons or 200 kips, because when we move to passive, you're going to see the difference in order of magnitude. Uh, on active anchors, all anchors are tested, and typically we use them on vertical walls, um, you know, basically vertical surfaces, wall or vertical surfaces. The best document on this is, is probably the Federal Highway Administration designing like Geotechnical Engineer Circular Number 4. It's an awesome manual. It came out in June 1999. It's free. It's accessible online. It was the first manual that I found that it was free online. I think I found it 2000, 2001. I printed and I love it. I read from cover to cover. Uh, and for me, it really was the way that I started, you know, doing these, these anchors. So the way that it works is you have that vertical wall. You have these anchors, as you can see there. Uh, you develop what is an active wedge, similar as ranking, similar as Coulomb, 45 plus feet over two from horizontal. That's going to be your wedge. Uh, you design based on pressure. You have the pressure diagram on the left. It's a trapezoidal pressure, Terzaghi and Peck. And you have the afferent area. Basically, each anchor has an afferent area in the diagram, and that's what it takes. Uh, that's the load that you're going to have per anchor. And then once you have that, you decide your bond, right? And your bond is just 
uh, a value that comes from a table, that is the shear strength between the soil or the rock and the grout, uh, multiplied by the perimeter, multiplied by the length. It's the surface area times that stress, and that gives you your load. And you just need to make sure that you had it, and this is extremely, extremely important, you need to make sure that you have your bond strength after your failure plane. Uh, you can also look for circular failures, so that that's what is on the bottom compared to the top, and that is the general the general principles. I'm kind of going a little fast on this, it's just because all this has been done, all this has been written, has been a standard for a, for a long time. Elements of the active system, um, you know, this is just to illustrate, we have, for example, this is a temporary wall that we have, and mm. you know we have piles, those are going to be the soldier piles, you put some lagging, wood lagging, that basically covers and protects against the soil, and then the anchor could be put directly on the on the pile, or it could be on a whaler, which is a little beam connecting to two beams. Uh, and then that's the that's the way that you pass all the force back into into the wall. Uh, another parenthesis: a lot of the pictures that you're going to see, I appear on them. As I said, I'm extremely proud of what I do. I always like to post on LinkedIn, Facebook, and all platforms, uh, which is awesome. It's important to share with others. The only downside is that when I do presentations, as you're going to see, I appear on almost every single one. So just be patient with me. All right, now, how does this look in a, in a cross section? So as, as I referred before, we have what is called the bond zone and the unbond zone. The bond zone is the part that is direct contact. So you're going to have direct contact between the grout and the rock. And you, you know, and, and that's basically where all the stress is developed. The unbond is going to be protected. How do you protect on a, on a steel, let's say on a strand or a rod? So the way that you do it, looking at this pencil, is that on the part of the anchor that you don't want contact, you put a little bit of sleeve. It's a plastic sleeve. Imagine it's like a pyjama or something like that. It's a little sleeve that protects from contact, and it has grease between the sleeve and the steel. On the bottom part, you don't. So what that makes is that when you put the grout, the grout is going to be in direct contact, and that becomes your bond zone. Now, your bond zone, which is where the contact is, cannot be of any arbitrary length. It has a minimum, typically, of, of 15 feet, and that's because there is variations in the rock, there is variations in the soil that you want to, to make sure that you are into something that is really reliable. Now, that part is probably easy to understand. The part that is a little more complicated to understand is that there is a maximum. And the reason that you have a maximum is because when I pull my anchor, right, I tend to mobilize the strength at the front of the anchor, right, at the front of the bond. And then that value is going to go into peak resistance. The more that I keep pulling, that peak resistance is got, start going from the front to the back. If I keep pulling and pulling and pulling, at some point, everything is going to be at peak. But if I have too much length, when I, when I keep and keep pulling, the top now is going to pass from peak to residual strength. And then what happens is, at that point, when the back of the anchor gets to peak, the front already passed residual, and my capacity is not efficient and effective anymore. So that's the reason that we typically have a maximum bond length of about 40 feet, which is about, what, like 13, 13 meters. All right, so now some pictures of, of the application of this. Uh, this is a wall in West Virginia. You can see we have the piles, we have the lagging, we have the different rows and the important whalers, right? So in this case, the anchor are going to the whalers. You could also have the anchor just going straight into the into the piles. There is many, many ways to, to do this. Uh, by no means I want to explain every single detail of this, of this detail. It's just there are already details for the connections, right? And then you have the anchor, you have the strands coming out. All this has invented, all this is sold by manufacturers. You have the head of the anchor, the strand going out, you have the wedges. Uh, my message here is don't get too overwhelmed by this. This exists already. Any manufacturer is going to do this. You don't have to design every single detail. These are systems that are already available. The way that it looks on a, on a cross section of the anchor is that you're going to have the little filaments. That is what creates the strand. So over there you see what six strands, right? They are separated. They are separated in a plastic disc, right? And one of the main things, something that is it, going to look strange for you right now, it's that black. It's like a black circle. It's, a, it's really a black pipe. It's a corrugated pipe. Uh, the form is still shit. So that is going to look a little strange for you because it's like, what is that doing there, right? So that is just a protection against corrosion. When anchors started, the main concern was corrosion. It was basically all this is dependent on the steel, and if the steel corrodes and goes away, then the anchor is going to fail. Now, active anchors are called active because they have the, the load. You construct it, you test it, and then you put the load, the design load, you put it all on it. So in other words, the load is going to be there for forever, right, through the design, of the design life of the anchor. So because of corrosion considerations, we put that little plastic thing, and it's called a, a corrosion protection. 
Now, when you think about it, that gives you two levels of corrosion. You have the grout itself that is giving you protection, and then you have the, the pipe. There is minimum clearances. You have to maintain a, at least half inch between the pipe or the corrugated you know, tube and the, and the outside of the hole. You have to maintain a minimum coating in the inside. Again, all this has been done. All this is a standard. It's on all manuals. You don't really have to worry about it. Just be aware of it. The facing element. So now you have your anchor. You design it. You construct it. You test it. We're going to cover test it later. Uh, but what are the facing elements? How do I connect my anchor? So you can have many kind of connections. You can have a casting place face. You can have lagging. You have shot grid. Uh, you can have solid pattern lagging, all, all kind of things. You have a sheet pile wall. Uh, and as I mentioned at the beginning, you can have whalers, which are the little beams, or you can just have the anchor directly into the pipes or the wall. So let's look at a few examples. This is a this is a sheet pile wall. It's a picture from almost 10 years. So you can also see the evolution of, of the technology, but the evolution of the engineer and how the, the looks change with time. So this is a, a very interesting project because we have a sheet pile wall. We did these anchors. We actually have right there in the picture, we have two rows of anchors. In reality, we're doing, at the end, we're doing three rows. This is just an intermediate point. We're doing a cut down excavation phase. So we start from the top and go down. Uh, obviously, the main thing there is the train load. Trains are significant load and they have very tight standards. Uh, that's the reason that picture took me like 20 minutes to wait until the right train was passing with the CSX logo and, and all that. Uh, but anyway, my point here is more than that. It's just that whaler. It's a continuous whaler on a sheet pile wall. So that's one way to to have it. What you see coming out is, is the strands. Typically, you leave the strand, which is this, this steel cable or steel, right? And that's what you tense. That's when you put the load. And when you finish, you lock the anchor with the wedges, and then you cut the remaining of, of those. In this point, they have not been finalized. That's the reason that they still have the, the strand coming out. The general sequence, we kind of cover it, but you, know, you, you drill, you make a hole, typically six inches. You place the anchor, you place the grout. Typically, it, it's a mix of 4KSI. It used to be 3KSI, but really the world has moved more into 4KSI. Uh, you test your anchor, extremely important. Every active anchor has to be tested. That's, that's critical because that has a cost and that takes time. Uh, but you have to test it because it's going to have a load all the time. So you need to make sure that the load is, it can be taken. And then you lock off the anchor. And that part is the key. Locking off the anchor means you are closing the anchor. You are, you are leaving it permanently with the load, but you don't want to put all the load. You typically put 80% of the unfactor load. You want the soil and the wall to relax a little bit and then engage the 100% of the design load. So always only 80%. Now, that was the world. That has been done. That was Terzaghi and Peck. That was a lot of the infrastructure that we know. Then in Germany, in Karlsruhe, they start talking about a concept in the 70s, well, more like in the 80s, which was passive anchors. Can we do some anchors that don't have the load all of the time? Can we do something that has the load, that basically we don't put the load, but we just wait for the system to activate? So it's a marginal tension in the construction. The anchors you know, activate with time and movement. And the key here is that the load that we're going to put, it's less than, it's way less than the active ones. We're talking really about 60 kips, which is about 30 tons. That is significantly different than the 100 tons that I was talking before. So basically what we're changing is, instead of going with single elements that take a lot of load, we go with a lot more elements that take a lot less load, but they are passive. They are not going to have all the load all the time. They're just going to be locked in place. And when the structure moves, they are going to activate. Now, the other thing, and this is a huge change, is that because before we have active anchors, typically are space 10 by 10 feet, so they are really widely spaced. That's the reason they developed the affern area on the face. We designed it with the trapezoidal face. When you design the soil wall, the soil nail walls or slopes, you don't really have that pressure at the face because now you have so many elements and solely closed by space that that face stability is not really your concern. And that's a huge concept to, to grasp. The reason is because now you put so many elements that you are creating like a reinforced mass. It's not behaving just as soil with pressure and anchors coming back. It's, it's behaving a lot as just a reinforced mass for a block and then internal stability. So that makes that your main concern on all this becomes really the critical, is basically the global stability with a circle passing through your, the area that is being reinforced. Now, in these ones, because the, the load is not going to be there 100% of the time, we cannot really use strands because the strands in compression don't take anything, right? 
uh, you want to use something that is more rigid. So we use bars. Typically, we go with number eight to number 11, 75 KSI steel bars. Uh, and then this concept reduces the cost significantly. So this is one of the applications. You can see it's a, it's a landslide. Uh, we are, you know, we're stabilizing it by that. We just went and put some nails, designed the nails, put, we put a steel mesh. Uh, we're also changing a little bit. And we're going to talk a, a little bit about this in a second once we talk about the facing. But, uh, you know, the standard today is that you do the nails and you put a steel mesh. And when I say today, this also, if you look at the picture, it's almost like 10 years old. But probably this started changing about 10 years ago. But today, this is the absolute standard. 10 years ago, we still did half of this with short grid, half of this with mesh. So the principle is you are stitching whatever slope was there, putting this face, and that's what is going to bring us the, the stability. Uh, there is also a design manual, Federal Highway has it. Uh, you can look it online, you can send me an email, uh, a sorry, a, a message on LinkedIn. But the main thing here is we're looking for these failures. We're looking for these circular failures that are internal. And what is the bond zone now is not defined by the way that you construct it, but is defined by the way the circle passes and what is behind your failure plane. So anything behind your circle, it's going to be your bond. And you're going to do it the same way you're going to multiply your the perimeter of the hole times the length behind the failure plane that's going to be your area and you multiply by a bond stress and that's going to be your resistance uh similar to the other one you also need to make sure that your bar have enough tensile capacity to to take that but the concept is very interesting because now i am not constructing putting a sleeve or anything like that to define what is the bond or the unbond in this one is full contact between the bar and the and the grout but what defines my bond or on bond is my analysis. So it's just wherever my circle, my critical circle passes, you can do this on any software, uh, you know, wherever my circle passes, that's my, that's basically from that point on is my bond zone. This is one of the projects that we, we have done just to illustrate, you know, three, three rows of nail, you know, mesh, mesh as the facing, uh, typical orientation, I guess I didn't mention it before, but even for anchors, for active anchors is the same, about 15 degrees. Uh, and maximum length of 35. Similar on this, since I have the potential to have, you know, the entire nail being bond, I don't want to make them more than 40 feet, right? So I always say try to limit those to like 15 meters uh, because you don't want to avoid that that mix between peak and, and residual. Uh, passive anchors came from active anchors. So our view regarding corrosion was similar. Initially, these pictures are from like 10 years ago. Initially, when we have a corrosive environment, we were put, put in epoxy coating. We were also put in a corrugated pipe that you can see in the picture. Uh, and then we have the grout. That was because that's the way we protect the active anchors. But the more we start thinking about it, we say, why do we need that, that pipe here? Because here we can have epoxy coating. Epoxy is already a barrier against corrosion. So if I add, I have epoxy, I have the corrugated pipe, and I have the, the grout. That is three levels of corrosion. The ones that we were looking on active were only two. So about 2014, we really start dropping this corrugated pipe. I don't use the corrugated pipe anymore on any design that I do for, for passive anchors. Obviously, we still have that protection on the active anchors because you, don't, you cannot have epoxy. Um, the wires are typically number eight to number 11, 75 KSI, epoxy coated and encapsulation if necessary. In, the, in, in reality, we don't really consider it necessary anymore. Now, the mesh. Uh, there is plenty of, 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 you know, manufacturers of high steel mesh. Uh, GeoBrog is a leader. Maca Ferry is another leader in the market. I don't want to, I love all these products. Don't take me wrong. I don't want to look partial to one or the other. What I want to absolutely look partial is it has to be a high strength mesh. It cannot be a, a chicken wire, you know, or the, or the fence that we use, for example, in Colombia growing up around like the soccer field or the basketball field, the one just to stop the wall. Not every steel mesh is a high strength steel mesh. So just be careful. I, I, I travel a lot for presentations and projects in, uh, around South America and Central America and, and the world. And I see so many of these, you know, soil nail stabilizations with a mesh that is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, and as you can imagine, all the system relies on the strength of the mesh. If I have really good anchors, but they are not connected to a competent facing, I have nothing. I just have a few holes on the, on the ground. So all these systems are, are soiled. These companies spend millions of dollars per year in research and development. Uh, they already have all the details. They already have the whole system. They, they have the hardware. So if you do one of these projects and you go with one of these, don't go cheap and just buy the mesh. 
you have to buy everything. You have to buy the entire system. Otherwise, it would never really work. So Geo Rog offers mesh in two, three, and four millimeters, uh, high steel strength. Uh, Macaferri also have the V600 mesh, which is a really good product. Some pictures now of the of the system already in place. Uh, you can see the nails. You can see the a tor reinforcement mat, which is basically like a geotextile that is put below, uh, and then the mesh goes on top, and then you have a boundary rope. We don't really design for the facing. Again, the facing is the responsibility of the manufacturer. We only define design for the global stability, uh, and and that's basically what we do. So all the little connections that you see in there will be responsibility of whoever is selling you the the mesh. Uh, typical installation procedure, so you can see the soil nail slope, you can see the nails, you can see the mesh, boundary rope. Just to kind of give you an idea, it's a really good green infrastructure system. Uh, you come here after a few days and all this is going to be covered in green. Vegetation covers really quick. Uh, this is a project here in Pittsburgh that obviously I have to take my, my companion of adventures, which is my son. Uh, more than that, on the picture, I wanted to just focus on the on the right side, you can see the, the terminated slope, you can see the top enforcement mat, you can see the nails, you can see the little plates that you have to put. Uh, you see something strange that is going there, like a cable, that's going to be the boundary rope, eventually it's going to be connected. This is like literally like two days before it was completely finalized. Uh, something impressive on that slope is I went a week after that and it was already covered with, with grass. You cannot even see where the nails are, which could be really dangerous for any kid that is trying to go downhill running because, you know, you're going to have this this thing is sticking out, but, but it's a really good system. It, it looks really, really good. Now, that being said, I don't want to give the impression that that is only done with, with mesh. Uh, as I said in the past, we, we used to do a lot of short grid facing. I think this picture is from 2000, I don't know, 15, something like that. Um, and this is one that we did. You can see the nails going out and you can see the short grid facing. Why I'm saying that the short grid facing on passive anchors could be replaced? Because passive anchors, as I said, are not fully low. I mean, they don't have the load all the time. They they rely on, re, re, you know, the soil needs to relax a little bit to go almost into an active pressure situation. Uh, so it reduces the loads and the system works. But then what's the price that you pay? When you allow movement, any kind of short grid is going to crack. Any kind of rigid face is going to crack. So mesh is way better because mesh doesn't have any consequence of that movement. It adapts pretty well. Short grid, it may be structurally sound, but it's just going to look awful. So that's the reason we have moved a lot from passive anchors from short grid to mesh. Now, in active anchors, you are not expecting that movement because you already induce the movement when you activate the anchor. That one has no problem having short grid. So always keep in mind, short grid, I'm not an enemy of short grid. I love mesh for passive, right? Short grid is good, but it has to it has its place on active anchors, not that much on passive. Um, there is plenty of, of 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 different things that have been developed. One that I like to always bring is this one. This is a this is a system that we did with mesh completely vertical, and it was the first time that we did it in in Pennsylvania. I have this idea for a while that you could use you could use the mesh for vertical. It was not only confined to slopes and and very steep slopes. You could go 90 degree vertical. Let me ask you this: What is the difference between an 89 angle slope and a vertical wall? One degree. But the way that you design it is completely different. So I have this theory. I thought for a while. I talk a lot with, with you know, with GeoBrock. Uh, they did some tests. I went and visited a facility they have in Vancouver, in Canada. Uh, we 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 make sure that everything was was in place and was working. And eventually, I had a project um, that actually was this was needed. So what you see on the right is it's it's a it's a it's a bridge that is being replaced, but right now it's still in service. What you see on top is the abutment of the bridge. It's a spread footing that is holding there, and then you have the deck. They wanted to make a vertical cut in front of the active bridge with the active footing uh, in order to have the space access. So because it was a temporary wall, I suggested this wall, you know, doing it with, with mesh. Uh, I knew it was going to resist, so it, it was literally half the money. It was half the cost that of, of what the initial plan was. So they agreed, we did it, and it worked. Uh, it was the first one in Pennsylvania, so that's the reason I went with my suit and tie and took my picture. Extremely proud. It's important to learn from your from your mistakes, but it's even better when you can learn from someone else's mistake, right? So, or lessons. In this case, it was not a mistake. It was not a failure. It was nothing. But something that I realized that I did not anticipate it was the high level of deformation. This had absolutely no problem from the structural point of view and the performance point of view. But 
even though I'm smiling there, the back of my mind is thinking, my God, this thing is deforming like crazy. Look, look at the wall. I mean, look how much is pushing and how much is going around the, the nails. It's perfectly fine. It, it's okay. You just need to be prepared for that, right? So if you are doing something like this, you will see that when you do something vertical, any kind of deformation, it shows a lot. If you let five degrees, nobody sees the deformation. So because of aesthetics, sometimes it's better not to do completely vertical. Just leave a little bit of a batter, leave a little bit of an inclination. It's going to save you a lot. I don't, it's not the structural part, I say, it's not the safety of this. It's just the aesthetics and making sure that the owner and people are not concerned. All right, the installation is very similar. You drill a hole, six inch, uh, casing if necessary. Uh, you know, typically you do it with an excavator. You just put the, the, the drilling tool on top. You can reach about 15 feet. Uh, you need to have your centralizers. You do tremi grouted. You test if necessary. In this case, you don't have to test every single one of the anchors. That's a huge difference with active anchors. We typically only test 5%. So that reduces, you know, the, the cost and also facilitate installation. And then you install the mesh and, and, you know, or the concrete. So this is just the, the construction sequence. You can see the equipment. As I mentioned before, it's just an excavator. You take the bucket out. You put this drill, you know, you put this, this attachment that basically drills into it. It's controlled, you know, remote operated. Uh, and then you just go and start doing the holes. Extremely important to all this is keep in mind, you may need to have casing as you advance this because the soil may want to collapse. So always kind of be prepared for that. Um, okay, another thing that, and a, and a big parenthesis I do here, if you, I believe that if you want to be a, a great geotechnical engineer, there are three things that you absolutely have to cover. You have to spend, or four things, you have to spend a lot of time studying, right? You have to attend all your classes, you have to read the books, you have to, you know, connect to these webinars, you know, do everything that is on, on your on your power to, to study. But you also have to spend a lot of time on the lab, right? You need to know the mechanics of rock, the behavior of soil. There is nothing better than spending time on the lab and doing this. Uh, and then at the same time, you have to spend a lot of time in the in the field. So I guess it's only three things. But anyway, going back, it's you need to spend a lot of time in the field. You need to see how these things are constructed. You cannot be a designer that never goes to the field. Uh, in the first years of your career, you have to be on the field. There is no other way. That's the way that I started my career. You have to be out there. You have to be... You have to see how things are constructed. You need to, to develop understanding of things if you want to design them later. So you're going to see a lot of young people on the, on the project. Uh, and those are all the engineers that work with me. I always take them to every single project. And it doesn't matter if it's too hard or it's too cold. It's like you have to see this. If you're going to grow in your career, you have to see this. So that's the reason you're going to see a lot of people around these, these steps. So we are drilling this one. This, this in particular is special to me because it's the first time that the contractor actually gave me the remote control. And I was able to drill a few of these nails. As you imagine, for liability purposes, most of the time, the contractor doesn't let you do that. Um, this is the tool that is being used. It's an eccentric bit. It goes through the casing. Once it passes the casing, it opens. Uh, and you know it gives you about the same diameter, a little more than the casing. And then you continue excavating. When you are done, you close it and remove it. Uh, you see the bars are there in the, in the bottom left. They have the epoxy coated. That's the reason they look green. And then they have the centralizers. Those little PVC attachments, they look like little balls or balloons. They basically just hold it in the center when you put the grout. Uh, then you go to testing. That's This is the reason that I wanted to, I mean, for doing a test of this, you only need one person, but I take a lot of people just to, to see how is the process. Uh, the testing, you want to make sure that you have your design load that is resisted. Typically, you only test 5% of the production ones in passive anchors and maybe one verification per nail, which is a sacrificial one. And the beauty of this is that after you test it, you don't have to really lock off to 80% of the load or anything like that, like active anchors. You just go and put, you know, basically you, you close the anchor, you put this knot and, and that's it. Uh, and typically you just do it with a torqueometer. So you put about six kips, which is about three tons. And it's just to take the slack out of the mesh. So it looks kind of like it, it, it already has a little bit of pressure. It's not too loose that then the soil is gonna lose. That is gonna be gone. Um, this is examples of, of some that are constructed. This is one in, in rock. You can do it on soil, you can do it in rock. Uh, as I say, the vegetation tends to grow up pretty fast. So when I take these pictures, I have to take them like immediately after construction, because if you go back, this is kind of what you're gonna see. So I, I love this comparison here. It's about a week between the two. Uh, you can see the top picture, we were doing those passive anchors at the top. We already did them, we already put the mesh, we already put the torque reinforcement mat, but we have not done the ones at the bottom. Now, when we excavated, that part, we also realized that the right side of the picture has a lot of rock 
and it was not really necessary to have this. So we only installed the treatment on the left. Now, look at the difference between the two. Look the amount of grass and vegetation that is already growing in the bottom one, right? I mean, give it a couple more weeks. You're not going to be able to see what is behind. Now, the other part that I want to focus attention is look at the rock that is on the right. I mean, it's completely stable. You know, it doesn't really, didn't really need to have that treatment. So the system is also flexible that you can design it one way. And when you start constructing, you can adapt things and save money. Because at the end of the day, it's all about saving money to your client. So a complete process, like look at complete process. This one is it's one in Pittsburgh. It's a wall that collapsed. So I'm standing there next to the sign that say do not enter, of course, and the chain and all that. Uh, but it's basically a wall that collapsed because it was just too old. We went and started drilling, right? So, I mean, we designed a, a treatment with soil nails, passive soil nails. So we drilled through the existing wall. It's a wall that, it, I mean, it collapsed because it's too old. So we still use it as temporary shoring, but that's that's about it. And then we did the holes. We put the we put the grout because this was the local. You can also see my son going with me there. Um, it was extremely funny. We put a bet that if I said, I'll buy you whatever you want if you're able to pull one of these anchors. So you can imagine him walking and trying to pull one of those anchors out. Obviously, it's impossible, right? That a human is going to pull one of these anchors out. But it's a, it's a funny thing. And I encourage everyone to, as I said, it's an attitude in life of being extremely proud of your career and want to share it with everyone and, and, and being a mentor, right? Being a mentor for friends, being a mentor for coworkers and even in family, right? It's, I always say my, my aspiration is not that my son becomes a geotech engineer. I would love that, but I, I don't, you know, I, I think he's going to find his own path in life, but I just want him to see how much I love what I do. And then he can translate that on whatever he decides to do in his life. Uh, I also think that, you know, growing up for him and looking this is probably extremely cool. It was for me when I was a kid that my dad used to take me every week into construction sites and, and things like that. But anyway, coming back to the technical part, you put the grout, you make sure the grout is it's good. You test the ones that you want to test. So in this case, because we have some on the upper parts, we have to have a lift. So we go and do the testing. We make sure that they take the load. Uh, and then after that, you go and put, you know, the facing. In this case, we end up putting, you know, in this case, we end up putting shot quit because even though the wall already failed, it was a still significant part that we use as temporary shoring. And I, I knew it was not going to be a major problem for flexibility. That thing still has a lot of rigidity from the old wall. So, you know, obviously doing shot quit sometimes is faster, right? You're just going to put them on. Uh, you know, we also have a company that was very, is locally based, very close. They even have their own plant. So in this case, it ended up being cheaper. So sometimes shot quit could, could also be useful, even on passive. Uh, another thing that I want to always bring attention is you see the reinforcement on the mesh on the upper left part, and you also see some geosynthetic stripes that are coming down. That's or, those are explicitly for drainage. Another nice surprise of the system, when we excavated, we also found a huge bedrock junk chunk right on the left part, like right next to my entire team is it is standing. Uh, so we actually also adapted the wall and it was not really necessary to install any nails or even any facing on that corner. Uh, it could be aesthetics things, right? Somebody may say, well, yeah, that's fine, but I don't want to see like a wall like that. In this case, this wall is not being seen by anyone. This is a park. You have the road on top, but the part in front is not really being seen by many people. That's the reason the client preferred to go with money, saving money rather than, than anything else. All right. Uh, now let's go into the testing of active and passive anchors. Uh, this is the last part of the presentations, the end is near. Uh, active anchors, all anchors are tested to factor design load. Uh, we basically do three types of tests, performance, proof, and special creep. Performance test is, is a test that do set cycles of loading and loading. You don't do every, so you test every anchor, but not every anchor in an active anchor is, te is test for performance. You typically only do one per sub structure. Uh, and what you do is that you put the load, you load up, you load down, you load up, you load down. You try to do cycles and recreate all that. Uh, proof testing is done on every single one that's just going to the maximum load and then releasing it, making sure that you have what you needed. And a special creep is rarely done, but it's just, if you are doing this on soil, that is like a soft clay or something that you think could have like some creep, you know, creep is basically the formation under constant load. Then you may want to do one of those. I have done a special creep test that go for 24 hours, just in situations that we have really concerns. Now, why do you do that? because they are active, because they have the load all the time. So you have to make sure that there is no relaxation. Passive anchors on the other side, typically you have one verification. Verification is just a sacrificial one. Uh, you, you do it for the installation purposes to make sure the contractor can do it. You also want to see maybe what's the maximum load. 
you can go higher than the maximum load if you want because it's sacrificial. Uh, and then you do proof similar to active. Those are just to the maximum load to make sure that the system works. But in this case, it's only 5% of the production aids. All this comes from the, you know, from the standard special provisions that are on all the design documents that I was mentioning before. Verification load, typically you do, you know, loading and loading to maximum two times design load. Proof is typically to only 1.5. Uh, there is different adaptations of this. If you are doing LRFD, if you are doing factor safety, it's very intuitive, depend, regardless of the system that you do it. Uh, you probably want to go to your design load and maybe a little more, and, and, and that's really what you care. Now, the acceptance criteria for active and passive anchors is the same, and it's actually the same for micro piles and for any, I would say for any drill system that we do that is a small diameter and, and could have tension. So the maximum deformation is it's set as half inch. That is an important number to have, but not, that is not the maximum deformation, it's the maximum plastic deformation. That plastic portion is huge. So what happens is if I have an anchor and I pull it, right, I'm gonna have the elasticity of the of the strand, or the elasticity of the of the bar, whatever I have that goes from the one zone to when I'm pulling, it's gonna have some elastic deformation. That is extremely easy to calculate, is LP divided by A. We all learn that in the strength of materials is the length times the load divided by the area and the elastic modulus. So you calculate that value and you subtract it from the total deformation. And what that gives you is the plastic deformation on the bone zone. Remember what we talk about going to peak and residual and not wanting to mix the two and all that. Typically, and we have seen this on many, many geotechnical structures. I mean, it could be a driven pile, it could be a micro pile, it could be an anchor. You pass from peak, you pass from peak to residual at about half inch deformation. It's about 1.1, 1.2 centimeters. So you want to make sure that during your test, you never exceed that value. You never want to go from peak to residual because that will just tell you that the test was satisfactory, but the anchor is ruined. So you want to limit that. So that's the first criteria. The second one is script. Typically, if you do a one hour test, you cannot have more than 0.08 inches in one hour. That means you are controlling that. Sometimes you have some specs of a, a, you know, like a different version, a modified version that is 0.04 inches in 10 minutes. I, I also like that one. If, if I'm doing proof testing, you know, it, it depends. If it's the only test on the job, probably I like to have one or two anchors go to the one hour test just to see it. Uh, but if I'm doing performance anchors, for example, on active, I can just let it go maybe with, with, you know, like the performance go the whole full hour, but the other was just go 10 minutes, many ways to combine them. And then the last one is no pullout. So basically you want to make sure that on the last two loads, you are not seeing a plastification of the material. You're not seeing that this thing is ready to go. If I plot it on a deformation, against load, I don't want to see it that is going elastically going with a slope and then it becomes super plastic and, and go flat. So those are really the three criteria more than memorize them or anything like that. It's just understanding what is behind. That's really what matters. Um, the testing itself, you know, depends. Active anchors, you're going to have a lot of heavy equipment. Again, you're looking at loads that are probably three, four times the loads that are passive. So you need typically a hydraulic jack. The jack is just what is shown there. You put the anchor head on the other side of the jack, the jack opens and that's what generates the pull. It also put pressure on the facing of the of your walls. You need to make sure that you have that, right? That you can that you're not gonna crack that wall. Uh, you have to have deformation gauges, you need to measure everything. You're gonna measure basically your objective is low deformation. That's what you want to see. Uh, and as I say, the the setup it's it's a little more complicated. I love this picture because you can see one of the engineers that work with me. Uh, we designed this together and then on the background you can see like four more engineers from our office that I took just to see the project they did not involve they were not involved in the design but you know as I said extremely important to spend time in the field um when you are doing passive anchors you can test them with a small equipment typically it's hand operated pumps it's literally like a you know a very small pump that you, that you do with hydraulics again because your loads are going very very small you can see the setup in general is a lot simpler and it's a lot cheaper um, for passive, because it's, it's light loads, you can have them, you know, like right now, this, I, I love this picture because we're doing testing on the left and continue constructing in the right. So it's very flexible and, and versatile to do testing on, on passive nails. And then this is typically what you're going to see. It's just, you know, depending if you are doing a cycle or just one, you just want to make sure you're on that elastic region that you have a slope that is, that is constant. Um, so some final remarks before we pass into any questions you may have. They are document, you know, it's a, it's a design that is absolutely documented. They are available standards. It's simple construction, right? It's simple, I said, because it's simple to explain probably in the, in the wrong, in a, in a complicated project, it's not as simple. There is many things that can go wrong. For example, 
I can tell you in, in projects in South America that have been involved, very fracturated rock. You try to you try to put the grout, the grout doesn't go. I mean, it's like you put the grout, but the grout just goes away. It never really comes out. Uh, there is all kind of things that you can do on on those problems. You can try to use like a stiffer mix. You can try to put sand. You can try to make it less fluid. Obviously, the price that you pay with that is that it, the installation itself could be a little little complicated. You never want to. I mean, some people we, we have put bentonite, for example, on that. That helps a lot. But the problem is you decrease the strength. So if you do that, you have to probably do a lot more testing, making sure that the anchors are taken. So there is all kind of variations that will be impossible to cover in a presentation. But in general, it's simple. Most of the projects that you're going to see is simple, but just be aware that maybe complications. However, all this is invented. There is many ways that you can address all that. Um, documented performance. Active anchors have been around for 70 years and they seem to be working. So that's always good. Uh, it's reliable because you test. I, I, similar to this presentation, I do many presentations on different state of the arts for drill shafts, micropiles, geosynthetics, slope stabilization with 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 deep foundation elements and this is one of the ones that i like the most this kind of technology because it's tested you test the anchors you know that whatever you design you test it and you make sure that it's there so that's pretty good and that's reliable there is diverse applications uh i mean as uh, most today I, I mostly focus on on walls and slopes but you know you use that we use this a lot on for example, in tunnels, right? When you are you're, when you are trying to stabilize certain blocks, when you are doing the you know like the entrance and the and and the, and the end, it also works. I have worked with this a lot in the oil and gas industry, trying to do excavations. It, it's as you can imagine, it's all the applications in the world. Uh, and then the last item that I have there is time. And the reason that I put a question mark because this is something new and it's something that is absolutely worth discussing. When these active anchors were invented, Tersagi and Peck, they were designed for about fifty years. In the 50s, it's really cool to say, yeah, I'm designing this for 50 years, right? Because you don't have any test that shows that it's good for 50 years. Every time that we try to model corrosion progress or creep, we don't do the test for 50 years. We just put conditions that accelerate time so they are equivalent to 50 years, right? So because of performance, something that definitely has become real that we see is the realization, the creep. When you put a soft soil or when you put a, a weak rock and you put a load for 50 years, it relaxes and it relaxes a lot. So creep happens and it's worse than that we think for certain materials, right? So for example, the state of, of California, Caltrans, at this point does not allow any design for active anchors for permanent application. That's huge. That changed a lot of things, right? So look what I said. For permanent applications, you cannot do an active anchors. Now, if you are doing it for a temporary application, that's fine, but they don't want any anyone for, for active, which is huge. And the reason is because they know it's gonna relax. Uh, other states, for example, Pennsylvania, they still allow active anchors for permanent use, but only if they go to bedrock. If they're on soil, they don't allow it. So my opinion on that is a little mixed because I do understand that after 70 years of seeing some of these anchors, we realize that they, they relax a lot. Uh, it's not a problem that is that common on passive because passive don't have the load all the time. So I see the point, but at the same time, the industry has developed a lot of things. Uh, for example, now it, it's very common. Manufacturers have it. You can have a little, a little cell that you put at the head of your anchor, like a little load cell that tells you how much, how much tension is on the anchor at that point. You can monitor your anchor. If you have critical infrastructure, you can install this and you can see if it's relaxing or not. And if you leave the, the, the face of the anchor open, like you can go and, and, and do a lift test or, or tension it, you can always go back and put more load. So I think right now the topic of time it's a, it's in, in active anchors is very hot and it's very debatable. But I think, I don't think that just, you know, kind of, Forbidden things, just saying that it's not allowed is it, really the solution. I, 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 I'm a true believer of instrumentation. And, and I think if you can instrument anchors, you can go a long way and still do very cost effective solutions. Again, that is not an issue for passive anchors because they don't have 100 per, you know, they don't have 100 percent of the load all of the time. That's the reason I also like passive anchors a little more because it's a little more, it's, it's more redundant. And in, in general, it's like a, I don't know, it, it's, I, I like to have more elements with less load seems the right way to do. So now, right, right before finishing this, um, 
this is one project that I always have to talk about. This is in South America. It was the collapse of the Chirahara Bridge. It was the collapse of a bridge that killed 10 people. I was not involved in the design. I was not involved in the construction. I was just involved in the forensic investigation. Um, they basically hired me to do an analysis and see we were with, you know, with a team that we did an analysis to see what was the cause of this, right? And it was not geotechnical, but it opened my eyes to many ways of doing anchors that I was not even aware. This is a, it's a fabulous system. That, again, the collapse has nothing to do with geotech or the foundation, but it's basically a hollow caisson, right? It's a hollow caisson that goes into rock, uh, a drill shaft, a, drill, a hollow drill shaft for foundation purposes. That is, ne I have never seen that in my life until I went to this project. I have seen access shafts, obviously, right? For tunnels and different things, but they are not supposed to take loads. This shaft is taking the entire load of the, of the bridge. Uh, and then they put this, they put micro piles at the bottom, and then they also put ground anchors on the back. The behavior of a structure like this, it's something that is not that well defined right now. The design of this, obviously I have to review it as part of my forensic investigation. It was all done with Plaxis 2D, Plaxis 3D, simplified calcs, right? Uh, when I did my analysis, I mean, I believe in numerical modeling. I did a PhD on discrete element method. So I have nothing against advanced analysis, but I'm also a guy that, I am very back to basics. I mean, I love to just do a free, simple body diagram. I believe in ranking. I believe in, in Coulomb and passive pressure, active pressure. So I also did my simplified calcs and I pretty much arrived to the same results as very advanced numerical modeling on 3D. And that's another message that I always want to leave. It's because numerical modeling exists, it doesn't mean that is is the only answer. I mean, we created an entire world without advanced numerical models, right? So. It's important to do it. It's important to be able to be proficient on those, but it's more important to understand the fundamentals of things, have your free body diagram and all that. I, 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 I always say there is, there is a big difference between an engineer and a true scientist, right? The, the, the true scientist believes the equations are perfect and the world sometimes doesn't behave the way the equations do because the, work, the world has anomalies. So equations are perfect, world has anomalies, sometimes they don't match. The geotech engineer knows that the world is perfect. The world does whatever the world wants to do. The world doesn't know geotech, doesn't know the equations that we develop. We have equations that work on certain occasions. All, every equation that we know is wrong. Absolutely, every equation we know is wrong. It just happened to work very well in certain applications and in certain ranges. What we have are tools on our toolbox that we can apply for different things, but, but we are not, through scientists that believe that equations is like the rules of the universe and all that. I mean, it's just mathematical devices that we that we have that allow us to justify the answers. But when you design, you have to design from gods. You have to design from your experience and when you know these things can do. You have to design based on the fact that you test these anchors and you know how much load they can take. That is your key, more than whatever mathematical computation you do. So going back to this, in this case, it was like that to me. I wanted to develop from very fundamentals and the fact that I ended up achieving to the same. But going, it's not a standard design. It's not something that we do commonly, but that is also exciting because that means that even though we understand a lot of things about anchors, there is still applications that we, that we are just facing for the first time. And, and that to me make it exciting. It, it's, it's the difference between this presentation that I did today and, and many others that I do is this one is technologies that are very prudent, very, very standard. You have design manuals. You can just follow design manuals and design all this. If I present about, for example, slope stabilization with deep foundations, there is no manual on that. There is a bunch of papers that I have done. There is a bunch of papers that other people have done and we use that as reference, but there is not a standard manual. There is no agency that has regulated that. So, you know, anchors is a little different. It's very established, but once in a while you have structures like this that they are very, very new and it's a challenge to understand how they work. All right, uh, more pictures from that. Uh, it was an, a very interesting experience. The first time that I went, I have to go down, rappel into this. They did not have the scaffold. They put it after that. And as I said, for me, it was very new to see all those anchors going around these, these shafts and, and the way they behave. We actually tested every single one of those. Uh, and then just to conclude, I love doing these presentations. I love connecting. I love traveling and talking to different people and different groups. Uh, like today, most of these recordings end up in YouTube. So if you want to learn about more about this or any other technology, uh, always just go to YouTube, type my name, type the technology you want. I do not have a channel on YouTube. I just have a ton of presentations with different organizations and professional societies and universities, but I pretty much cover most of the, of the current geotech technologies. You can have 
presentations about micropiles, you can have presentations about drill shafts, you can have geosynthetics, slope stabilization with geosynthetics, slope stabilization with the foundation elements, uh, subsidence, how can how to calculate settlement, especially in mining applications, subsidence problems. Uh, there is all kind of things. So I, I, you know, as I said, I'm a true believer of free education. I believe that's the way it should be. There is plenty of resources on on YouTube. Uh, as a hobby, I play chess. I love chess. Actually, invented in India, uh, and I think most of the chess that I have learned in my life has been all through YouTube, right? And and I think YouTube is a great tool to to develop and 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 manuals and articles again, all free, right? So if you if you need any of these, just send me a message and I'll be happy to to share the information. And with that, I finish. I'm also, besides chess, I'm a very big fan of soccer. So I can never finish a presentation without showing pictures of me wearing the, the Colombian national jersey, because I still believe it's the most beautiful jersey in, in soccer. So if, I think we have time for some questions, right? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Guerrero, for a wonderful presentation. And um, uh, are there any questions from the participants? We can talk soccer, we can talk Formula One, we can talk chess, we can talk any any anything that comes to mind. We can talk actually about chess. It's extremely amazing. All the young people that is that are coming out from India, all the grandmasters. And, and I do believe that the probably in, in a couple of years, the next big grandmaster is gonna, you know, the next big champion is gonna be from India and it's gonna take gonna take all the tradition, you know. Okay, so I have a couple of okay, we have uh... So we have a question from Mr. Harsh Sharma. He he's actually thanking you for a, this valuable presentation. And his his question is how to decide orientation of ground anchors for soil and rock mass slope. And the second question is is installing anchors perpendicular to joints in case of rock mass provides great efficiency. Yeah. Okay. So no, that those are great questions. So thank you very much, Sharma, for the for the question. How to decide orientation of ground anchors for soil and rock. So on most of the applications, on everything that I show is slope stability or or like a wall, when you think about it, the more horizontal you can put your anchor, the better, right? Because when the anchor is, let's say if the anchor is horizontal, that means that all the force go in that direction, right? It goes along that. The moment that I incline it, right? What I really care, it's mostly the, the, the horizontal projection. But if I have some angle here, that means I need I only use the cosine of that angle. Now, if you use an angle that is, is small, let's say 10 degrees, 20 degrees, the cosine of that tends to be 0.9. It, it, it is very high. So you remain, you retain big part of the angle. So in general, the principle is you want to go as horizontal as you can. But the problem is because of construction considerations, you cannot make it horizontal. If I make an anchor horizontal, and I'm just using like a gravity grouting or or some small pressure grouting. How do I know that it's gonna go all the way to the to the end of my hole? I mean, these anchors could be, you know, as we say, 40, 45 feet long. So let's say 50 meters. How do I guarantee that goes? So because of that, you cannot just go horizontal. You have to put a little bit of an inclination. The typical value we use is 15 degrees, regardless if it's soil or rock. Um, sometimes you have to go a little deeper too, because let's say your your anchor is getting beyond the right of way, your anchor is extending too far and you don't own that land or the owner doesn't own that. So that's another way to correct it. You can put it like a little more inclined. I typically never pass the 30 degree. I think that the one that I have done for applications like this is 35. So typically between 10, 15 and 35 will, will be, you can run the analysis. You will realize that typically the one that is closer to horizontal is gonna be more efficient. Uh, and in reality, there is not much difference between soil and rock. One consideration could be the stability of you know, of, of the soil or the rock, obviously the the flatter you make, the, le the the more susceptible it is to collapse. But I always deal with that problem with the use of casing. If, if there is that concern, I use temporary casing and that's it. It's cheaper to deal with the problem with temporary casing than they start playing with the with the inclination. So are you satisfied with this answer, Mr. Sharma? Okay, we'll go with uh, another. We have an anonymous <laughs> user. He has asked uh, that. What? Hello, sir. Sir, good evening. Hey, good evening. Yeah, sir, I would like to know uh, when our face is open and uh, our extent is uh, not known, then how we can uh, determine or how we can fix the length of uh, rock bolt? 
and what will be the diameter of rock bolt when our extent is not known 4 meter you, 8 meter 12 meter or an anchor you mean extend on the vertical or extend into the into the excavation into the into the behind behind oh, the oh yeah so yeah i mean obviously to to do something of of good quality you have to have a boring right you have to have some kind of boring that tells you what is behind right um because otherwise you are designing with your eyes closed you don't know what the conditions are however many times you if you're doing a temporary excavation or something like that sometimes you don't know what could be behind uh in that case you just have to take a very conservative approach right and, and assume that you have a material that is gonna be very loose very you know very prone to collapse you are gonna definitely have some you're gonna need to have some kind of temporary casing and then your bond part i will design it just with a really small value now keep in mind you're gonna test these elements so even if you if your design kind of looks like a little bit shady and and shaky right because you don't have that much information after you install it you're gonna test and you're gonna make sure I always make a joke that I said I can design an anchor based on the color of the soil because I don't care. I mean, at the end, it's like I, I'm just going to use a very standard value and I'm just going to test it and make sure that I can have that that capacity. Okay. Because sir, I have seen one collapse and uh, at that collapse, all of the rock bolts came out with the face. It was developed and the length of the rock bolt was eight meters. So that time I thought... Uh, Maybe the block which was uh, failed, it was basically a slip slide and it was more than 8 meter which was required to fix with anchor. It was actually not the case for rock bolts. What I learned from that collapse that we should have must uh, provided long rock anchors more than 15 meter or 20 meter. Correct, correct. And, and that's probably because if they didn't know the complete extent of the soil and the conditions, it may be the case that they just use a very high and aggressive bond value. So if you have a high value and it's not enough, then the whole thing is just going to come out. The, the, the anchor is going to pull out. You know what I'm saying? It's not going to have enough capacity. It, and I mean, obviously, without knowing the case, but if you do those anchors longer, then that strength will have hold you and, and it probably will have not failed. I mean, I see a lot of, unfortunately, I see a lot of failures like that in, in, in South America on different projects. And it's always like that, right? It's, it's anchors that were not long enough, and then the full thing just kind of came down. The other one that is extremely, extremely common is that they put the anchors, they put the vault, the walls, but they did not put the facing on time. So it is extremely important for everyone to understand. An anchor constructed and tested, it's absolutely nothing until the moment that it connects to a face. Otherwise, it's just a hole on the ground with steel and concrete, right? Okay, so we have Thank another Thank you so question. much, sir. Uh, so the question is, what kind of instrumentation do you recommend in anchors to monitor the lifetime load, say in caverns? How much percentage of total anchors uh, should be monitored? And does this differ for active and passive types? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Thank you very much. Because if you, I mean, I'm a big fan of instrumentation. I think instrumentation is the best way to proceed on every project. I'm a true believer of the observational method by PEC. That's the way the, the observational method actually was developed on you know excavations and with anchors uh with anchors it's very easy to know if things are working out or not if you measure because if you see the pressure if you have load cells installed and you see that the anchor is taking more or less load that's a big thing so as so i said they sell now these load cell devices that you can monitor the you know the tension on the on the anchor uh so a big fan of you know big fan of of, of having those if you can now Another piece of instrumentation that goes a long way, it's an inclinometer, right? If you have an inclinometer on your wall, you can see how the deformation is going. You can see where the deformation is, is happening. If you can have an extensometer, also extremely, extremely valuable because you can see if there is vertical movement. If you can have, for example, a total station with laser points, right, uh, or even radar that shows you the face, right? Is the face bulging? Is the face behaving, especially if you have like concrete or short grid? So there is plenty of instrumentation over there. Now, what percentage? It depends, right? If, if you are using active anchors, at the end of the day, let's just be completely honest. It's a, it's a problem of money. It's budget, right? If you do active anchors and you can instrument them, instrument every single one because there is no one that is more important than the other. That, that's the reason I, again, when I do projects abroad and, or, or I visit or, or whatever, and they tell me like on active anchors, what is the percentage of active anchors that you, you know, what is the safe percentage of active anchors that you need to test? 
I say there is no concept of a percentage of safe. In an active anchor, every single one needs to be tested because every single one is going to have the load, right? So if you're doing instrumentation, ideally for active anchors, every single one. I understand it may be too expensive. So you may have just a percentage, but when you know that the answer is everything, any answer after that is just going to be a compromise, right? It's like, well, as much, as, as much money as you have, as, as many as you can, the higher the better. Now, very different answer if you are doing passive anchors, because passive anchors, again, are they are not supposed to have the load all the time, right? So if I monitor it, I can see the load, but the fact that it's only taking half the load doesn't mean that the anchor is not performing as intended. It's only intended to perform 100% of the load on 100% of the anchors at the limit equilibrium when the thing went to, to the brink of failure, right? Most of the time you're not gonna be there. So your anchor probably is not gonna register the load. And it doesn't mean that it's not working. It just means that it hasn't fully, fully activated. So if you're doing instrumentations on those, I typically just say, it's more like a surveying. It's more like knowing how is the deformation happening. Maybe a total station with a few with a few targets that probably can go a long way. You can still have an inclinometer. I have done that in the past, and the inclinometer is a really good way to know is this moving enough? Are the anchors really engaging at this point, or they have not been engaged yet? So yeah, it, it kind of depends. Like but unfortunately, mm -hmm. targets and optical targets, MPBX. Exactly, all of that. All of that is it. It's the way to do it. Is it's also some of the cheapest solutions that you can and do. And monitoring part. Correct, it, especially on passive anchors. And now if you are doing active anchors, then it, it's good to throw a few load cells just to know how much are you getting, how much pressure are you getting. Okay, so we have another question from uh, Sandeep. He is asking that, can you just tell, show, give some information or the references how bond strength shall be estimated in shale type of rocks? Yes, no, that's an excellent question. And, 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 and in purpose, I don't put those tables because I don't want to be used on the wrong context, but the bond value that I was referring, those are tables that are on every single one of those documents that I mentioned, they all have those tables, right? So I'm gonna just tell you a few typical values. Uh, a good sandstone, a good limestone, is about 150 PSI. Uh, it could be up to 200 PSI. Uh, a shale could be, uh, typically a shale, if it's a soft shale, I assume that it's more like a soil. I go down for about 40 PSI, you know, things like that. Soils could be anywhere between 10 PSI, 20 PSI, 30 PSI. Now, these numbers, I have them by memory. I do not put it on the presentation <laughs> in purpose because they depend a lot on your local geology. And the last thing that I want is people taking some value from a table developed in the Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia and thinking that you can apply it in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I mean, we all know that geotech is extremely local and those values. So, but what I can tell you is that you can find them all online. And you, the most important thing is whatever you are designing, I'm sure there is a code that applies. I'm sure there is some design manual that covers that is close by. And that's, you know, you should take it from there. Uh, another thing is you develop, you also develop your own database of, of these bonds values. It's, it's very simple because it's just one number, right? It's just what is the bond strength. Now that also depends if you are doing gravity grouting or pressure grouting. Most of the time you design for gravity grouting, which is just a tremie, right? You put a tremie to the bottom of the anchor and then you just, maybe you pump it with a little bit of, of energy, but it's not that much. It's, you know, you can also do pressure grouting anchors, which you probably apply 150 PSI, 200 PSI. You basically pump it with pressure. And what those, do, what, you know, the, the, the final effect is that you densify the soil around it. So those anchors are going to have a, a lot of higher capacity. But beyond any value that you assume for design, the, the, what matters here is again is the testing because one there, there is a there is a friend of mine in, in in Colombia that have this sentence that I love and and I think actually he took it from someone else but he says the the successful results of one anchor is worth more than the experienced opinion of a thousand experts right you can have a thousand experts telling you what is a bond stress what is that that doesn't mean anything until the moment that you go and do a test and if I do the test and I see what is the bond value. That's it. So try to go conservative on whatever value you assume. Always make sure that you are involved. You always have to be involved on the testing as a design engineer. You have to see the test. You have to evaluate the results of the test. And then you can decide and say, okay, this value was good or not. And anchors are really easy to adapt. If I do the test and I see that it's not enough, I can always just increase the one length and, and see if the, if, the, if the load is now taken, right? 
So, and, and then you start developing your own database of, of what are values, you know, and things like that. But, but if you are looking for a preliminary answer, if you go to Google and put anchor bond values, boom, you're going to have hundreds of tables. Again, the risk is not the value, it's knowing if that represents what you're trying to apply it. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. We generally use this Little John references as well for this bond strength to take this bond strength value. So next question we have from uh, Mr. Yashwant. He asks that if nail length requirement exceeds 40 feet, how to consider such cases for design? Yeah, so that, that's always common, which is like most people never realize that there is a maximum length of bond zone, right? And it's like, oh man, now I have a problem because I can, the belief is I just keep increasing the length of the anchor. It takes more and more load. Well, the, the solution is really easy. Just do more elements, right? So instead of, I mean, the principle number one when we start the design is you want to have as little elements as possible and longer elements, right? But the moment that you go and maxed out on your length, then just start making more elements. Just imagine this, if I have the circle failure, right? And I have my anchor and this is from the circle to the end, only this part of the anchor is really working. So ideally I want to increase the the, the anchor so I have more bonds on, but if I can do, do that, well then just put another one, right? I mean, just split the space in between anchors or something like that. It's going to cost you more, of course, because now you're increasing the number of anchors, but that's your solution, right? I mean, it's, it's better to do a solution that costs more, but it, that is sound than it works rather than doing something that you know is incorrect. Thank you. We have an, a question from Mr. Navin Kumar. He's asking what type of ground condition are suitable for the application of anchors in NATM? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, Almost every single soil is, is suitable. I mean, you can do anchors on anything, right? That's the principle number one. As long as, okay, I'll take that back. You cannot do anchors on karst geology. I have done it and it's a pain because if you have some kind of cavities, something you're just going to start losing growth. But assume that you have the soil, that there is no voice, there is nothing like that. Uh, in reality, you can do it on any rock, on any soil. It's just a matter of having a, a, a bond value that is low enough, right? Like if I'm doing it on something that is bad, I just need to go conservative. Now, what is bad, what is good, what is conservative, what is not? Uh, it's it's a strange sometimes because a soft clay, a high plastic clay is bad. That one, I think everyone really has the concept, right? If I have a very soft clay, that's gonna be bad, right? If I have a clay, but it's not soft, it's very stiff. That is actually pretty good for a soil, right? I mean, obviously it's not good for a sandstone, but but it's it, it's good for a soil. Now, granular materials, it are, are different because when they are loose, people believe they are not really good for bond. They are not good for installation because you probably need a casing because otherwise they collapse because they are loose. But once you put the grout, especially if you put a little bit of pressure, your bond zone is gonna go from this diameter and it's gonna infiltrate into the sand and you're gonna have a huge diameter. So I have done very interesting passive anchors on loose sands that we actually end up doing bond zones that have a huge diameter. And then as a result of that, you get a really good anchor. Then sands obviously are also gonna be good. Rock-wise, limestone, sandstone, any competent rock is gonna be good. Most of the time, weather shales, claystones, they tend to be horrible. However, if you design them assuming that they are soil, it's better. A bad rock, it's always better than a good soil, right? I mean, kind of. So, so it, it's all about kind of what you assume now. Sometimes when the rock is fractured, people tend to believe, oh, it's not gonna be good. It is good if you can put the grout and it infiltrate those cracks and, and things like that, because you develop like, it almost look like a root from a tree, right? It's like grout that goes and then goes in all directions. However, you are, you are, we are playing with a sharp knife there because it's good as long as you can put the grout and you don't have excess grout, right? But if you are putting the grout and all the grout is being lost, then it's no good because now it's like, okay, I need the grout to be there. So, there, but as I say, there is different ways that you can handle that. I have typically handled with either putting polymers, expansive polymers that seal that, uh, using a little bit of bentonite, less than a, li a little bit. It has to be very controlled because otherwise it really hurts you. Uh, and then doing post grouting. There is another way that you can do, which is you can grout, right? Have a first grout, leave the tremi, and then come later, do pressure grouting. That, because you still have the tremi, when you pressure grout again, then you break the, you, you break the grout that was already set in there, and now you have a second like a second way of grouting. So there is many things that you can do. Honestly, they're all based on experience on projects and, and, and things like that. But uh, fortunately, there is not really that bad or that good of a rock. It's just about how you work with it. 
Okay, thank you for the celebrate answer. Uh, we have uh, a question from uh, Himang Jain, and the question is: What changes happen in design as we make intermediate loops in the anchor? Intermediate loops. What? What do you mean intermediate loops? Doing the testing or? Can you is is he or he available? Yeah. Can you just? Uh, uh, hi, uh, hi, Sebastian. This is Himan Jain. Uh, hi, hey, Himan. Uh, How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm working with the high speed rail corridor project in Mumbai, in India, and uh, we are uh, installing ground anchors here in the shaft areas, and uh, the vendor is uh, installing the intermediary loops. Uh, I am assuming that it is to somehow reduce the overall strength load on the anchor or something. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. There are intermediary loops that he is using in the anchor. In the anchor, yes. Yes, yes. It's in the main anchor. Yes, yes, yes. Now that that's a great idea. Yeah, th those are a lot of the new. You know, thank you very much for the question, Mang, because I, I I appreciate it. It gives me opportunity to explain something more. Uh, Remember what I was talking about, the maximum bond length, right? So when I put the maximum bond length and I have my bond here, then what I'm saying is I'm reaching peak at the front and then from peak goes to residual. And then, you know, I don't want to have the case. I want to have the case that everything is on peak. I do not want to have the case that peak is being loose at the end and it's only at the back, right? So there is, for example, there is one anchor that came along probably like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, which is called the reverse anchor. Or compression anchor and what you do is that you put a little plate at the bottom of the anchor so when you pull you actually start mobilizing from the back towards the front so you have peak at the back right and then the more that you pull it's from the back that the peak start mobilizing and then there is another concept that is the intermediate anchor the way that you were describing it that is the multi uh, they have many different ways depending where you talk about the world but it's basically it's kind of like using one hole and having many anchors inside so let me put it this way. Imagine that I have the entire length of the of the anchor. I put one strand that goes all the way to the bottom, and then I have my little bond zone there. And then I put another one that doesn't go all the way to the bottom, but it just goes to where the bond zone from the other one started, and that goes a little behind. And then another one that goes behind that, and another one. So what I do is I have a one call, but it's like a multi-anchor in just one hole. I have different bond zones for different one of that. It's very simple to design because it's just the same principle as all. I just take whatever each strand is going, right? And that's my bond zone. And then I add the other one. And I, then I add the other one. And I keep adding all my bond zones. Now, what happened is when I'm doing it like that, the geotechnical capacity is increasing significantly. The structural capacity is controlled by the tensile strength of every single one of those. So I need to analyze those separately and making sure that I'm not, you know, that I'm not exceeding the structural capacity. But that is a... That is an excellent, ingenious way to do it. It's becoming really popular outside of the US. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I have seen it in, in, in different parts of Europe, and, and you just mentioned it in India and in Mumbai. Uh, I know in South America they've been trying to do it, but not very convincing. I'm always open to that. I mean, I think it's, I think it's, 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 it's great ideas to try to make anchors better, right, and reduce costs. So as long as it's analyzed the right way, and as long as every single detail is being covered, I think it's, it's good. Uh, is there any specific code or specific literature uh, regarding this kind of uh, anchor design? Yes, 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 yes. There is uh, there is a good friend of mine that has uh, some publications. Fortunately, most of the stuff is in Google. Like if you just type it like multi, you know, like multi ones on anchor and stuff like that, you're going to see a lot of papers. I don't think that right now, at least in the US, there is not a there is not an official design manual or anything like that. I, I think the geotech engineer circular, the one that I mentioned at the beginning, I think it talks about it. It just talks about the existing of this. I don't think it goes into a specific step by step. Uh, but I mean, you can find some papers on on, on Google, right? And, and and some information. But to me, nothing beats like just thinking, right? Just taking the diagram and then just looking. Again, your critical variables are each bond zone is separate from each other. And then you need to check the structural capacity of every single one of the elements on the different bond zones, making sure that you don't overstress it. Thank you. So do you have do you still have time or are you we are you a bit no of because... course i have all the time yeah. in the world for you guys if you i yes. mean it's i'm mean, starting my day you are the ones that want to go to sleep man <laughs> <laughs> so we we have a question from harsha so it's a very it's a quite long question so harsha if you are online you can just uh, ask him to him ask the question to him uh hi sebastian uh, it's a nice presentation 
Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, like I have an off topic question. The question is related to uh, consolidation and uh, ground improvement. Uh, so the thing is, um, uh, like we have a flyover to be constructed uh, within three months and uh, um, the ramp of the flyover. Uh, so it is um, uh, uh, like, uh, so basically the foundation is entire uh, soft soil. So we need to improve the ground. Uh, we are thinking of going with uh, uh, like uh, stone columns or uh, maybe PVD drains. Mm -hmm. And because of uh, uh, the uh, ground improvement technique, uh, like um, the console, the soft soil settles, but uh, big, uh, so to get the good amount of consolidation, we need at least uh, three months again and uh, uh, three months of bleed period. But the construction should be completed by within three months. So that's the thing. Uh, and uh, uh, the important part is uh, so we start. We th we are thinking of constructing and uh, uh, doing the consolidation at the same time. And uh, the important part is uh, the construction is happening. That means uh, the fascia wall, which is uh, the supporting lateral support system, fascia wall and the geogrid uh, is going to settle along with the consolidation happening. And in terms of structure point of view, uh, the structure, I mean, the fascia wall should not be settled much, uh, but because of consolidation, it is settling more. So that's the tricky situation. So what to do in this case? Yes, yes, I actually have. I appreciate it. I, I have had that situation many times, uh, which is exactly what you say, doing ground improvement. So like you can do the weak drains and, and maybe you are also doing CMCs or RAM aggregate peers or, or some kind of ground improvement, but you still have settlement. Uh, I have a whole presentation about like geosynthetics and geosynthetic structures. And, and, and part of what I talk about that is the beauty of all those systems is the flexibility they have. Uh, I have done like typically for MSC, we used to use three inches. We said if if it's about three inches, it's fine. Now, le le but let's start talking what settlement matters. The only settlement that matters for you is differential settlement. If the whole thing settles, it's typically not a problem, right? As long as it's uniform settlement, then it's fine. The problem is when you have differential settlement and you have angular distortion. But typically, you know, typically MSCs are designed for three inches. So three inches is about what, like eight centimeters, something like that. Uh, we did a wall actually last year that we, it was similar to what you described. We have a three month quarantine period, but the, the contractor needed to construct the wall in those three months, basically not even respecting our three month quarantine period, right? Um, and what they did, there are two ways to do it. One is they can put a facing that is not a permanent facing. They put some facing that is, you know, it's, it's a temporary thing. It has all the straps in this case, but like a, you know, some kind of MSC stabilized. And, and we did another one that actually had geogrids. So they put some kind of temporary facing and then once it's settled, they go back and put a permanent facing, right? So it's like you put a permanent facing, you let it kind of sit, the wall is there, and then you just in front of that go and put a permanent one. So it does distort. If the deformation is not that bad, there's another option, which is you can go straight with the permanent facing, but the joint opening between the panels, you let them be big enough that they can be reaccommodated after all the settlement has has happened, right? Um, in reality, the best advice is don't do it. Don't do any. Don't do any stuff like that. Just let it settle, right? Just let it settle. A quarantine period is called a quarantine period for a reason. The idea is that you cannot do anything. Let it settle, come back, do the wall the right way. Now, if you cannot do it, then there is these options. It's just every single one has risk. The main thing is to get involved. The manufacturer of the wall, right? Whoever is selling the panels and all that, they are the ones. I, I have had situations that I thought it was a problem. I have I was predicting seven inches of settlement. Seven inches is a lot. That is what? almost 20 centimeters that's a lot of settlement uh, and i remember i passed it to the i passed it to the manufacturer of the wall and you know it was a t wall which is similar not t wall gravix wall which is similar to t walls it's basically modular wall with stems i pass it to them i say no problem within georgia last month or something like that that had like twice your value and i was like really i didn't know right i mean it's like i i know the geotech part i didn't know how you can adapt with that many manufacturers have systems that can adapt and if you get them involved since the beginning, they probably have either the use of temporary facing, the use of these joints. Uh, there are ways that they can work this out, right? So it's always just important to get them involved. Uh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, uh, uh, the temporary uh, fascia walls, that that sounds a very good idea. And uh, we are expecting uh, a differential settlement because one side of the ramp is uh, traffic uh, and other side is buildings. So we are expecting yeah. a differential settlement. So maybe yes. the temporary walls is uh, helpful. No, 
Uh, absolutely. And, and if you guys at some point later on, maybe 2024, want to do the, the presentation about, you know, geosynthetics and, and temporary structures and all that with that, I'm, I'm more than willing and, and, and excited to do it. So it's it's a great group. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you a lot. No, I don't know. Okay. So we have a question from Mr. Rajiv Prasad. He's asking that in sheared phyllite rock mass with the steep dipping with the with wet ground condition. So can we uh, pre can pre-stress cable anchors having 15 to 20 tons can be used in this? Yes, you can. You can, and I have done it. I I I look at one in in Colombia actually in a in a very. It's funny because Colombia is very far from India, but it was the same condition. It was a sheer phyllite, com almost completely vertical on the deep, and you know, and we use anchors. The way that I did it is because we use. It was so broken and it was so bad with the bedding that I said that's a soil. Basically, the bond stresses that I assume were the ones from a gravel, right? It's basically it's so broken. I said just design it as a gravel and 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 that's fine and and it worked. I mean, you we were able to take the anchors. It was the the grout takes were a little bigger than were anticipated, uh, but they were prepared for that. They knew that typically on an anchor you should be prepared to have a grout take of 200% of the theoretical volume so basically i can calculate the volume of my anchor based the volume of the hole and if i have if i'm within two times that volume that is still considered for a contractor part of the part of the cost that it was provided right anything exceeding 200% of the theoretical then that has to be paid extra any grout like that and 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 as i said when you know that you are working into a situation that you can face excess grout more than the 200%. You just need to be prepared to have contingencies, right? So as I say, stiffening the mix with sand, a little bit of bentonite, there is many polymers, uh, trying to do a two cycle installation, install it first, leave the tremie, try to pressure grow through the tremie, break that and all that, that's another way to do it. So there is plenty of ways to do it. The important part is if you know and you anticipate these issues, you need to have the budget because as I said, it's all about money and it's all about having that budget ready for when it needs to be used. So. And and, and 15 and 20 tons, it's it's not that high of a load. So that's the reason that, that it could be easy to achieve. I think uh, this uh, there is one more question. So in a project, it's an anonymous, anonymous question. And he's asking that in a project in which he's working, he or she is working currently. So they are actually planning to provide anchors in concrete walls of RCC structure. Uh, through this anchors, a part of load from the structures will be transferred to the external support. So can he or she get the details of such anchors in concrete or any case study or something? Yeah, that, that, that's an interesting. So if I, if I understand correctly, it's basically the anchors are going, but they are not going to rock or salt. They are just going to concrete, right? To And, and I have done that in the past. Uh, and it's exactly the same thing that if you were doing it on soil and rock, the only thing is, obviously, if it's concrete against concrete, right? You can just treat it as a as a rock. It's not as yeah. bad as a bad shale or anything like that. Just go and and I will use a, some kind of value like 80 PSI, something like that. I mean, a little bit conservative. Now, the main thing is that now for your geotechnical problem, you already solved your problem. You already put your anchor. Your anchor is developed the capacity. Now you are transferring that load to another structure. Just make sure what is going on with that structure, right? Like if I'm like, we're doing one project here in Pittsburgh right now, that that was an option that we considered at some point. But the problem is we were putting these forces now into a spread footing and that spread footing was now going to be pulled. So the spread footing is the one that have the problem. My anchor was fine, but it was the spread footing for the existing structure. And in that case, we had to abandon that option because of that, because we said it's just too risky to start messing up with that spread footing. So it's not only your problem with the anchor, but it's even if the anchor is working, those forces are going somewhere. How are you affecting that somewhere and are you messing it up? So yeah, so we have finished with all the questions. So Excellent. I have I have one of my I have one question from my side. So as you said that uh, the load diagrams which are given by Tezagi and Peck, so they are actually uh, devised in uh, in in the previous century. And and uh, the thing is they they have only given this load combine load uh, diagrams. For certain type of homogeneous material like sand, stiff to hard clay or soft to uh, medium clay. So if there is some uh, mixed ground condition like sand, clay, sand, clay, like what? So what if I want to do it analytically, not the empirical, not the 
FEM modeling. So if I wanted to do mm -hmm. analytically, so what type of diagrams and what type of factors should I consider for that? Yeah, no, it's an excellent question. So yes, that was designed by Tersagian and Peck and it was the last entry, but they have been slightly modified. If you take the original Tersagian and Peck, so uh, another hobby that I have is that I collect geotech historic books. So I have the original edition of theoretical salt mechanics by Tersagi, and I have the original edition of the, you know, the other one that was Tersagi and Peck. So, and then I have the original edition too from Tersagi, from Peck uh, on foundations, the one, you know, so I have all those originals and are beautiful. I never use those books. For me, those books are right here in my library and it's just for the historic value. Everything that is there obviously has been updated. Uh, when you look on the new diagrams that are on FHWA, and especially the ones that are on ASHTO, they have changed a little bit. They are still trapezoidal, but they change a little bit to, to make it more realistic based on subsequent testing that has been done, right? But I agree with you, but that is assuming that I just have one, one soil. So how do I do it? Correct. So I still do it like that, right? I still do it like that. I go conservative. I take the lowest soil, and then I, I basically do my diagram. Now, when you when you end up designing and when you end up testing it, you're gonna make sure that you have that, right? So once you put the load, you know it's gonna be there. So the diagram itself, it was just kind of a way to get you there. Now, another thing that I do, and, and I say that's the reason that is it's important to also not read too much into things, is when I design multiple rows of anchors, right? You do your diagram, and then each row has a different load. And you can have your design and all that. But at the end, the way that I do it is I design every single row for the maximum load, even from the other rows. So that way to me, it's very conservative because I'm preparing every row to be able to take the load, right? So the way, so as I said, I designed it as every road could take potentially the maximum load. That doesn't mean that the lock of load that I do is the, is the one from the other rows. I still lock off to the maximum load on that row, but I prepare that anchor to have the capacity of every single row. So when I do it like that, I'm also preparing myself a little bit to say, okay, well, even if the diagram is slightly off, I'm still prepared, prepared for that. When you start putting your design into plans, you start simplifying things and you typically go conservative. So even if it was some kind of imperfection of those, it's absolutely covered. It may be a little bit on the conservative side, but to me, anything that is on anchors should always be on the conservative side. There is, there is certain structures that you can afford. Let's say a failure is more of a service failure than a catastrophic failure. Let's go back, for example, the case of piles. Typically, if a, if a pile foundation fails, it doesn't fail. It probably just settled more than what you thought, but it's not a catastrophic thing. With a ground anchor, a failure is catastrophic, right? Yeah. I mean, if, if the anchor doesn't work, the entire thing comes down, the wall comes down. So I always believe on going a little bit on the conservative side. Now, the, the, the part that you say, and I know you didn't intend the question on that, but the, designing anchors with, with final element method and all that, you can do it, I just could not sleep at night if I do it. I mean, what I'm saying is it's a good way to do it, but nothing replaces do the, the hand calc and making sure that you have enough, right? So that, that's what I said. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Again, I did my PhD on, on numerical modeling, but it's just, we are simple people and we have simple minds and simple concepts. We need to develop these checks that are absolutely, you know, like the diagrams and stuff. It takes five minutes, but it, it, I like to sleep at night and, and I think it's important to have your mind completely clear. Play a lot of chess before going to bed, and then, you know, and then sleep. Yeah, rightly said. I I also have the same philosophy. I I usually prefer the hand calculation than the FEM modeling. So thank you for this uh, excellent uh, presentation. And uh, I I think this this was the very intense Q and A session we have up till now. This is <laughs> since since past two two and a half years. And no, uh, two or three things which I really love, loved about the presentation was that you 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 made the presentation as SI units like you give the conversation in meters, tons, and all. And the other other thing is your personal touch to the photos and all. Like uh, you have you have used yourself as a time frame to show it is well, this time, the past <laughs> ten years and all. So. And and one more thing that is uh, the comparison between the engineers and the scientists, which you have said. No, so, awesome. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm yeah. glad you appreciate all that. And as I said, I'm, I'm always available. Uh, if you guys want to do more presentations in the future, and it's a, it's a great group and you can tell by the by the questions. And yeah, let me know when you post the, the YouTube link because I absolutely will share it with everyone I know. Yeah, so, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Guerrero for your web, uh, wonderful webinar on anchors. 
and i'm sure that your experience will be useful to everyone who has attended and the one who will be watching this webinar and i would like to inform that our past webinars are also on the youtube channels for all the people who are here and before signing off i'll request all the members to just take the ym membership to avail this benefits like this webinars and once again uh, thank you for sharing your experiences and for all joining this webinar thank you thank you have a great have a great night i'll have a great day you guys have a great night have a, have a great day ahead bye bye